Well, good afternoon and welcome back. How's your day been so far? Good? Yeah. Fantastic. And uh, that means that you have probably gone to some really good concurrent sessions. Round of applause for all of our concurrent <laughs> sessions and presenters. And forgive me for eating this cookie. It's just so delicious. I can't let it just sit here. Um, so uh, thank you for, for coming back. I don't um, have an enormous amount of new content to um, cover, just three points I want to offer in addition to what we shared this morning and then leave the balance of time for that Q&A and engagement that we had um, promised earlier. And as best as I can tell, my phone is um, lighting up from American Airlines. I have a flight at 610 from Springfield. So I think we have good enough time to go through what we want to do. We don't have to feel rushed. Um, just to highlight again, if you have questions, you can send an email to chee at osu.edu. This whole notion of cultural navigation was something that um, I sort of fell into. In 2014, I was the keynote speaker for the National Association of Academic Advising, uh, NACADA. It took place in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I went to Minneapolis with one of my um, you know, mentees, uh, interesting story related to issues of diversity. So that at that time, the young man, his name was TJ. I met TJ um, at a conference where I was speaking. I was not speaking as a professor. I was at a church conference speaking. And at the end of my presentation, these two people, mom and dad, came over to me and said, you know, we want to introduce you to our son. They introduced me to their son, TJ. And TJ said something. That was, you know, we all get to hear it over the course of our lives. He said, Dr. Strayhorn, I was really impressed by your, you know, what you did tonight. I want to be like you. And I told TJ, don't be like me, because if you're going to be me, then who am I going to be? Be yourself. And we're going to figure out how to connect you to your greatest self. TJ started saying things with me uh, that he wanted to be a teacher and he wanted to go into education and wanted to go to college. At the time where I met TJ, he was already like 24, 25 years old and had not um, started college or even attempted it. So I told him, you know what, let's get together. Um, I can help you start to think about college and get there. Long story short, at some point, TJ said he wanted to see different colleges. And I said, well, I go to different colleges and speak. So why don't you come with me to the, um, this talk I'm going to give in Minneapolis for Nakata. TJ, I learned, had never been on a plane. I'm, I'm always on a plane. So um, when you take a person who's never had an experience and a person who's had an experience, there's something that the experienced person can give to the novice, to the person who knows nothing about it. But it takes the person with experience trying to unpack what um, you know, um, psychologists and sociologists have tried to unpack and call empathy. It's not sympathy. It's to step into the shoes of another person and try to imagine the world as they would. So if you fly all the time, Imagine trying to be a person who, or imagine stepping into the shoes of a person who's never flown. So here's me trying to help TJ get prepared for our trip. And I said to TJ things like, when you pack, make sure that you pack fun size stuff, like me, you know? Um, fun size toothpaste, fun size lotions, nothing over three ounces. Put it all into a plastic bag, otherwise they're gonna take it from you. Um, you know, thinking to helping him think through what would you actually need to wear. You don't need to put on like, you don't need to pack 50 outfits we're there for a day, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, anticipating all of his concerns. So before you know it, TJ meets me at the airport. He's prepped and he's ready for the trip. We get into the plane, we get through security, it's, it's great. Um, we get on the plane and as we take off down the runway, TJ's like, why is the plane going so fast? I said, oh, I forgot to tell you about takeoff. Okay, so takeoff. Before you know it, I'm talking to him about what it's gonna feel like, this idea of your stomach dropping and all those kinds of things, the sensations. We're up in the air, and as we're flying, we're talking, and I told TJ, when you get on the plane, you know, it's gonna be a longer trip, so bring some snacks, things you like to eat. So he's sitting there eating his snacks. And then finally, the pilot comes over the loudspeaker and says, um, I'm putting on the seatbelt light. Um, I'd like everyone to stay seated. We're expecting a little rough air. And TJ looked at me and said, what's rough air? <laughs> Forgot to tell him about turbulence. So then I tried to describe to him turbulence. And then turbulence happens. 
And TJ, who is um, taller than me, that's not hard to do, um, is, has, has now sort of moved over again into my seat. I'm used to sitting beside people who move into my seat. Before you know it, um, TJ, who's like 6'1", has his leg wrapped around my leg under the bottom. His arms are wrapped around my arms. Before you know it, I realize that I had to figure out how to help get him through this moment. So what I say to him is not, you know, TJ, calm down. Um, TJ, um, relax, because if you've ever been nervous, Someone simply telling you to relax doesn't work. <laughs> but actually, what we've learned from a lot of medical research is whenever you're nervous, if you press in the palm of your hand and rub, it will calm your nerves. Not because that's something magic, it's because it's redirecting energy in your body, away from your um, preoccupation of your thoughts of being nervous to what you're feeling in your hand. So applying that to practice 35,000 feet up in the air, I turned to TJ and said, TJ, where are you from? He said, you know where I'm from. I said, where are your mom and dad from? He starts telling me where they're from. I said, how did your dad become a pastor? Wait, is it just you or do you have sisters and brothers? So who's the oldest? Who's the middle child? Where are they? Before you know it, I have circulation back in my leg and in my arm. <laughs> TJ has taken back to his seat, and I start realizing what my role is to get him through. Before you know it, we've moved through the turbulence. We're about to land, and TJ's still in the middle of the story about him growing up and his peers. Because when you know something about a culture, there's a, a really powerful role that you can play for a newcomer, someone who has not experienced that. That, to me, was sort of the beginning thoughts about this whole notion of cultural navigation. Um, here's some things that we know from research that relate to this whole notion of cultural navigation and our work with students is that society is changing. I told you earlier we have 40 million Americans working in jobs that did not exist last year. We have a new generation of people um, who are aging, by the way, millennials. And on average, millennials will have 12 different jobs by the time they're 40. There's another generation that we're already trying to wait to name and get books and articles about, right? Um, so all of this is happening. Society's changing. We also now know that if you want to be successful, successful defined as make good money. Good money usually defined as about $45,000, $50,000 or more a year. There are two things that you, two types of industries or two types of occupations that generally um, guarantee that you will have a job and that you'll be successful in that job if you are able to fix something or fix people things that we know from research. Those two skills are critical. If you can work with people and help, I mean, look at Iyanla Benzant. That's why she's so famous, because everybody wants Iyanla to fix their life, fix people, or fix things, fix gadgets, fix machines. We also know that we're living in a knowledge economy where um, you could be one who produces knowledge, like those of us who are researchers in the room, but you don't have to be the one who produces knowledge in this society. What you really have to be able to do is use knowledge, translate knowledge. Apply, uh, apply knowledge. Society is changing, and all of that maps onto all those jobs I showed you earlier and many of the job groups of the future that are shown on the screen. Lots of people moving into all of the different um, industries that we have in society. And there's a major take-home message, one that I never thought I would have to like remind people of, but I learned in um, the work over the last 11 years that you do have to remind people that all students want to succeed. Tall students want to succeed, poor students want to succeed, first generation students want to succeed, students from Appalachia want to succeed, foster youth want to succeed, students who don't even go to class actually want to succeed. They just have no connection between class attendance and performance in the class in their mind. Now, by the way, it's not all their fault because stuck somewhere in higher education, maybe not in your institution or in your department or in your program, but somewhere in higher education are professors who you can pass their class even if you don't go to, um, you can pass their course even if you don't go to class. I met a student who said something about, Dr. Strayhorn, you know I'm getting a D in my class and I don't know how to get a better grade. I said, um, what's the class? And they told me the name of the class. And I said, so what are you all reading in the class? They said, well, I don't know because I don't have the books. And I thought, well, do you think there's a correlation at all between not having the books and a D? in that class and the student said, oh no, not at all, because most students that have gotten A's in the past said, you don't have to get the books because none of the tests and none of the quizzes are based on the book. So if you've ever met a student who doesn't buy the books and you're wondering to yourself, why don't they buy the books? That's why, because somewhere in the enterprise of higher education, maybe again, not your campus, your institution, your department or program, but there are courses in higher education where you don't have to buy the books to succeed. And all it takes is one student to tell another student, 
that that's the case. That student then tells another student, before you know it's on social media, before you know it, a whole generation has decided you don't need to buy the books. But no matter what, all students want to succeed. I've never met a student, never interviewed a student, never surveyed a student who said, you know what I decided to do? To go to college to just fail. You know, I've, I have this great idea. I, have a, I want to spend all my mom and dad's money or my own money paying tuition just so I can fail. I'm trying to be a loser in life, and I'm trying to go to college and, like, drop out. I'm trying to be kicked out of college. I woke up this morning, got cleaned up because I don't want to pass in college. That doesn't happen. People come to college because they want to succeed. What happens, however, is once they get here, they don't know how to be successful, how to find success in college. We've also learned from research that certain factors seem to matter, like college readiness. Students must be ready for college. I've written about this, but we've also learned that there are four core dimensions of college readiness. That in order to be ready for college, students have to have certain cognitive strategies, ways of thinking. I talked to someone earlier about mindsets. Mindsets. Carol Dweck's work on mindset. Um, Carol is a psychologist who says there are two uh, mindsets that operate in society. My best example, you know, sort of um, succinct is one mindset is fixed mindset. The other, which is usually the one that is correlated or associated with success, is called growth mindset. Fixed mindset is a person who's so concerned with judgment, all they believe is that they have a certain amount of ability, a certain amount of skill, a certain IQ, and that their job is to, um, that they're stuck with that. It can't change. They can't get more, can't get less. Maybe they can get less, but they certainly can't get more. And that their job is to find success with what little they have. A person with a fixed mindset is like me in fourth grade. In fourth grade, I met a young lady um, named Becky. Actually, she had good hair, too. And, um, <laughs> and, and Becky didn't know this, but we had been dating for like three months or something. Um, and finally, I decided to clue her in to the fact that we had been dating. And so I um, remember my fourth grade teacher, first and only male teacher in my entire life, Mr. McCarthy. It was a spelling test. He said, the word is serenade. And he said... I'm struggling to use this in a sentence. I've got to think of one. I raised my hand and said, Mr. McCarthy, can I help? He said, sure, Terrell, how? I said, I have a um, sentence for the word serenade. He said, go ahead, give it to us. I said, Terrell serenaded Becky by her window late at night. And then I sang a little ditty to her in the middle of the class. She was so embarrassed. I thought she was overcome with, like, love until recess. <laughs> until later that day when we went out for recess, she walked up to me and slapped me. And said, um, Terrell, that was embarrassing. And I said, you don't like me? She said, no, I don't like you. I said, why, because I'm black? She said, no, because you don't wear glasses. Because Becky wore glasses. I wear glasses today because I went home that day and told my mom and dad, I need to wear glasses. I can't see anything. You guys all disappeared, you know? And they took me to an optometrist who gave me like a .50 lens. I mean, nothing, basically nothing. But as a result of him giving me that lens, I now wear a negative 7.5. The message I take from that is, first of all, never give up your eyesight for love. Um, <laughs> but the second thing is this, that when we start to depend on resources, help, that we don't need, it actually weakens our own strength and abilities. If the doctor had denied me glasses in fourth grade, I may not wear glasses today, but because of that, I do. All of this is important because um, quite often students have to know certain things, certain cognitive strategies. In fourth grade, I thought I was this smart, I wasn't athletic, I was academic, I wasn't musical, I was academic, and it wasn't until I had a sixth grade teacher, my only black teacher in sixth grade, Miss Cannon, who's now deceased, died of cancer, who told me one day, Terrell, you can do anything you put your mind to if you work hard enough, that shifts over to growth mindset. One who believes that success is a function of what they put into it, effort. But it's not just effort, it's effort matched with the kind of support you draw on to be successful. Growth mindedness is one of those cognitive strategies that we need to formulate or develop in students. It's also true that students need certain academic behaviors and content knowledge, but most importantly, they need contextual skills and knowledge. And those contextual skills are the things that are born out of higher education. They're the things that all of us in here know. They're the parts of our culture that I think are implicit, tacit, you, you wouldn't really know them unless you've been here or know someone who's been through higher education. Those are the things that we can help with um, in terms of culture navigation. Quick review of what I talked about earlier with belonging, simply to know that belonging does matter, and it matters for all students. In 2010, I wrote a book about black college students. This is before I knew 
belonging was the language. And I talked about things like supportive relationships for African-American males. For African-American males to be successful in college, they need supportive relationships with faculty and staff. Said differently, black men who connect um, with faculty and staff in meaningful ways, that is, they know a significant number of faculty and staff, but more importantly, they feel like there's someone they can go to, ask for help, lean on for support, someone who they can be vulnerable to, someone who can coach and show them the role, mentor them is what we would call it, but mentoring is that kind of mentor. I'm talking like intrusive mentoring. Mentoring, I always say, mentoring should never be comfortable. If a, men, if a, if a protege is, is like, they say, oh God, I love being mentored, then mentoring's not going well. Um, <laughs> Mentoring ought to be intrusive, and I formally, firm, formally and, um, and honestly believe that um, the protege should be asked to do something that they don't want to do. Intrusive mentoring requires the protege to um, show up for a meeting that they can't understand why in the world they should go to this. But at the end of it, they absolutely understand that the mentor has invested in them by inviting them to the meeting that somehow they should be um, put in the presence of people who they are uncomfortable around. But by the time they get there, much like TJ on that plane, they are prepared for that moment, and at the end of it, turn to the mentor and say thank you. That um, intrusive mentoring somehow pushes the protege to be better than they are right now, to think higher, to have higher aspirations, higher goals for themselves. But most importantly, that there's a thrust of support embedded in the mentoring. That's the kind of mentoring that seems to work best for African-American males. My best story is my own doctoral advisor who is in one of my best mentors. He's my life mentor. He's like my life coach. He is my Ian Van Zandt. His name is uh, Dr. Don Creamer. He was my advisor, professor at Virginia Tech. Um, you know, what didn't Don do for me? Not only did he chair my dissertation, but one day I remember, have you ever read the book Two States with Maury? So there's a book in my soul. If I ever find the time to um, write it, you might get it on your shelf. Um, but it's called Wednesday with Don, because every Wednesday of my last year of doctoral study, from 10 until, I met with my doctoral advisor to talk about my dissertation advisor, my, my dissertation, to talk about my life, to talk about whatever. Now, so some weeks I go in there and we'd be talking about just straight dissertation, but I was Don's last student, so he retired with me which meant that if you've ever retired, you haven't yet, but when we, when we all retire, what's gonna happen? Let me tell you what's gonna happen. Um, all the things that are on your shelf, you're not gonna need anymore. All those books and those strategic plans and all those notebooks and all those guidelines and all those student codes of conduct, you don't need that stuff when you're retired. So you start giving it, you start either throwing it away or giving it away. So I'm sitting here meeting with Don every Wednesday and I start watching his shelves just vacate, empty out. And I'm like, oh my gosh, he's giving away all these books. I need these books. I don't know why I need these books. I just want them because they're my mentors, right? Well, one week I go in to meet with Don and he has a stack of books, maybe three or four for me. And he said, Terrell, here, these books are for you. And he walked me through each one and why he was giving it to me. For instance, he gave me my first copy of the book called Leaving College by Vince Tinto. And he said to me, your work is gonna be on student success. I see where your work is going. You're gonna talk about student success and you're gonna build on what Tinto has done. You need this book in your life. It meant something to me for my mentor to tell me that I would build on the foundational work in my field. Um, secondly, Don one day gave me a book. He said, Terrell, this one's um, called Enduring Values. And I looked at the book and I thought, Enduring Values? I don't do any research on Enduring Values. and I don't know anything about this topic. So I said, why are you giving me this book? And he said, look at the copyright year of that book. I flipped it open, looked at the copyright year, and he said, is that year significant to you in any way? It was the year that I was born. And that was the way that my mentor signaled to me that he knew me. He had high expectations of me. One day he said to me, Terrell, um, what do you plan to do when you finish your PhD? And I said, well, I'm not really sure, but I think I'm going to go back to D.C., which is where I was living before going to my doctoral program. I said, I'm going to go back to D.C. and find a job. He said, you know what, I think you should be a professor. And I said, what do professors do? This was after I don't know how many years of being in higher education, right? <laughs> Still did not know what professors really did other than teaching a class like every so often. Um, and what Don did was he walked me through his calendar on his phone two or three weeks of his life. It's always hard, to, I mean, so um, Robert and I were just talking about emo being emotional. So I'm gonna try not to be emotional, but I, I broke down in Notre Dame the other week talking about this, because it's crazy how life, what a mentor can do for a protege. My mentor walked me through his calendar, three weeks of it. 
I remember one day he said, I'm teaching this class. And I said, okay, well, I, I'm, I'm in that class. I know you're teaching that. He um, went to another day, and it was wide open. I said, well, what are you going to do on that day? And he said, whatever I need to do. I said, but don't you have stuff to do on campus? He said, no, I don't have to come to campus every day. And I thought, you don't have to come to campus every day? Oh, my gosh, that's a job for me. Tell me about it, right? But most importantly, I remember if it's like, if I remember correctly, it was a Wednesday. He was going to be in Texas. I said, what are you going to Texas for? And Don said to give a keynote. And I said, what's a keynote? Eleven years ago, I did not know what the word keynote meant. And here it is 11 years later because of my mentor opening my eyes to a world I did not know. I can give keynotes every single day. That's what mentors can do for protégés. So for all of us in the room, never forget that you have the power to be a mentor to a protégé. But only to the extent that you're going to be intrusive. It means you have to expose them to your world, expose them to your life. And as a result of Don allowing me to peek into his world through his cell phone, his calendar, um, I said, yeah, that's the, that's the life for me. I think I need to do that. And as a result, I decided to, I shifted gears that day to be a professor because of a mentor. Turns out that mentoring works, but I think mentoring only works when it is intrusive and well-designed. And then when we find out that students have these kinds of really well-formed experiences that foster belonging and connection with faculty and staff, it actually produces positive outcomes like higher retention rates and higher grades. But all of this is sort of embedded in this larger notion that's on my mind, and that is that higher education is a culture. What is a culture? A culture is a collective of individuals who are generally brought together because of or through shared attitudes, patterns of behavior, values. Cultures have their own language, their own um, traditions. If, if I have one great um, concern for higher education, it is that I don't think we have a whole lot of traditions left at our campuses. That's what made us different from other cultures. And so, um, you know, what does it mean to be a, you fill in the blank, uh, what does it mean for a student to come to our campus and to be a part of our culture? What is it that's unique about, other than orientation and commencement, I don't think we have many traditions. Except, you know, I go to campuses, and, um, I've gone to Binghamton University a couple times this year. Binghamton University, they have green Fridays. On Friday, you always wear green. So the first time I went to speak, I learned about Green Friday. The second time I went back a couple months to speak, I was happened to be there on a Friday and I packed green pants. And the campus was like, oh my gosh, he remembered Green Friday. But it's because I wanted to be part of the culture. And I can tell you, when I had on green pants on Green Friday at Binghamton, it felt like I was at Binghamton. Although I'm not a professor or an administrator, being, I fit into the culture. How do you, what um, traditions do we have in place that we help students become aware of, that help to build this sense of connectedness, community, shared experience. I'm a part of something. I think we can start to build them through clubs, organizations, and other things. I'd, I'd love to hear your question about that. But I think um, higher education is a culture. We have our own language. First of all, in higher education, um, we have a language like provost. Everybody in higher education knows what a provost is. Outside of higher education, ask someone what a provost is. And they'll say, is that like a vice president? Is it a director? No, it's a provost. So where do they fit on the hierarchy? Um, everybody in higher education knows generally where a provost fits. It's part of our culture, that language. Um, a few years ago, my research team was um, collecting data from parents who are in pre-college outreach programs. And one of the questions we asked parents was like, what did you learn from this program? One mother gave me another insight about the privileged language of higher education. She said, I remember the very first thing I learned from this program. They kept talking about credit hour, credit hour. Your student, son or daughter, has to think about the number of credit hours, credits that they'll enroll in. She said, and the only thing I kept thinking was, if my son or daughter's chances of being successful in college have anything to do with my credit, they don't stand a fighting chance. <laughs> in higher education, we know that credit hour is simply the language that we use to assign weight to educational experiences progress toward degree. But if you've never been to higher education, how do you know what credit hour means? You start hearing the word credit and you think first association to the way that you think about that word. And you might think that it's an hour on campus where banks are giving out credit cards. All sorts of things start to swirl through your head. Who's going to help parents and students understand this new language and also um, decode some of our processes? Shown on the screen are a couple of assumptions that we have embedded in our culture 
about success. For instance, higher education is a very individualistic culture. That is, most faculty reward the highest grade to the person who gets there fast, first, fast, outsmarts, outpaces, or outthinks others. That's how higher education is set up. Number one question most academic advisors end up asking a student is, what is your major? What do you want to be when you grow up? What are you thinking about minoring in? Interestingly enough, though we've opened up access to students from collectivist orientations who really struggle with this cultural clash between our individual values and their collectivist orientations, their answer to that question of what is it you want to major in is, I don't know, what do you want me to major in? And most of us think that's, a, you know, that's them not trying to put forth the effort to make a decision. No, actually, that's, an, that's a collectivist response to an individualistic or, uh, question. And it's asking for input. Help me figure out what the world needs. Help me figure out what society needs. Help me figure out what the campus needs. Where are um, students needed in majors? Where are, where are the pressing issues of our day? And how do those map onto majors? It's, like, it's actually an invitation for help and assistance. But often it's dismissed as, no, 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 I can't make this decision for you. To a student who's used to making decisions with other people. How do we appreciate this um, cultural clash and then help students work through it? We also have this notion that in higher education for students to be successful, they should seek help. But I think that we, especially um, those of us who work in higher education, need to also think about how can we give help, anticipate students' needs, and offer the help that they need so that they don't have to necessarily figure out where we're located or figure out what forms of support are available. There are many, many, many strategies for being successful. Higher education is a culture. We have our own language. We have our own traditions. We have our own codes of conduct, our own values. What else can I share about this one? So codes of conduct in um, cultural spaces are usually the rules that govern what can and cannot be done. It also usually outlines the penalties associated with violating cultural norms. About two years ago, I was invited to what I call academic jury duty, academic jury duty. Academic jury duty, in my opinion, takes place on academic misconduct committees. It's when a person, a student, has been charged with some academic misconduct, and they put together the committee who's going to hear that case, and they call on all of us to sit on that committee. So about two years ago at Ohio State, I was asked to serve on a committee for a student who had been um, charged with plagiarism. And they had given us the document. The professor had outlined all the sections that they were charging or naming as plagiarism. And then it was time to hear from the student to explain the case. I had reviewed the document, deliberated with my colleagues, and in walks the student. This is a diversity conference, so you have to appreciate this. In walks the student who, when most people look at the student, they say there's a black student. Actually, the student is African. The student walks into the room, sees me, and goes, and I nod back. And then the woman beside me leans over and says, do you know this student? Because if you know this student, that's a conflict of interest. I said, <laughs> I, said I don't know the student. She said, I just saw you nod at him. I said, that's how we nod to each other. I mean, it's, it's a universal sign for people of color just nodding. You don't have to know each other. You can actually can, anybody can do it. I mean, if I nodded, you just nod back. So before you know it, here I am like on the verge of being um, accused of um, a conflict of interest when in fact it's just a cultural greeting. Universal cultural greeting. Don't know the student, student sits down, they review the case, the student breaks down to tears at the review of the case, and then explains that in their culture growing up, they are taught to have great respect for certain people. That you would always have respect for the teacher because the person would know nothing if it wasn't for the teacher. That growing up, you always have respect for the author because the author gives you one of their greatest gifts and that's their words. And once the author has given you a gift of their words, who are you to change their words? That to them it would be like imperialism, awful, disrespectful, to go and do violence to the words of an author which is why they left the words intact in their document. After the student finished their case and we started deliberating, I shared with my colleagues, I said, do we have any evidence that anyone taught this student about the cultural transition, the change, that in their culture of origin, this is called respect, but in this culture, it's now called plagiarism without proper citation. 
because that's exactly what happens for so many students. When we open up access without paying attention to the cultural exchanges that happen, that as people from different cultural origins or cultural bases move into this new culture, who teaches them those rules? That becomes the curriculum for pre-college programs. That becomes the curriculum for black men's initiatives. That becomes the um, curriculum for pre-college outreach programs for some of the first year seminars to help students understand the rules of this new culture. And because we could not come to a decision that someone had actually told the student things had changed, I thought it was unfair to penalize the student for plagiarism. Rather, make it an educative moment. Now teach them the rules. Teach them how to then properly cite and paraphrase. Um, so it was a few years ago when we were studying one program that does a lot of this. It's called, um, it's sponsored by, I know I can, it's called Blueprint College. Blueprint College is a three-week program that teaches students and their parents a lot of stuff about college. It's all about helping more students get to college. Um, what we learned from this program is that it does work. 68% of the students who participated applied to college compared to 42% of students who did not participate. It's also true that 60% of the students who participate in this program applied for aid, compared to 51% who did not participate in the program. But I think the results that are on the next couple of slides nail this whole cultural navigation piece and the role that we can play a little bit more succinctly. I just want to highlight a couple of these. One is that when you look at the red bar and the yellow bar, all you have to notice is where are their taller bars. So for instance, this red one that's um, five down says my family um, is concerned about my ability to pay for college. The program seems to reduce concerns about paying for college, increase efficacy in talking about college, giving students and their families all the things they need to know. But interestingly enough, here's what we know about college costs. That prior to the program starting, many families thought that the average tuition at a two-year community college was $18,000 a year which is outrageous, way, way higher than it ever is. That many of the parents thought the average um, tuition at a four-year college was like $50,000 a year, way higher than what the national average is. But we've known this for years, that parents and families overestimate the price of college while they underestimate the, pr the amount of aid that's available. For those of us who know something about the cost of college and the amount of aid, there's another role for cultural navigators to play, helps students and families set reasonable expectations about college. Then there are also these interesting roles that um, around what's needed to be successful in college. We've learned that many students and families have never even thought about the number of courses that one must take, the kinds of educational experiences in school or outside of school that prepare students well for college. I've met parents who ask me every day, like, should I take my son or daughter to a museum if I want to take them to get them ready for college? Should I uh, make sure that they um, have gone somewhere, traveled somewhere, studied abroad? All these things are great experiences to have, but they're not necessary essential for accessing college. The role of a cultural navigator is to help parents and students set um, normal expectations, regular expectations, um, reasonable expectations, expectations that are achievable. To do that, though, we have to understand where students and families begin. So this is my um, sort of launching, um, not launching point, my, my landing pad. So a few years ago, um, I tell this story about how I went to the gym. I went to the gym because all of my friends started going to the gym. And, um, and if you're not careful, people will make you do what they do just because we are all influenced by the same forces. So I start hearing from all my friends that they're going to the gym. Before you know it, I'm like, I'm gonna go to the gym. Now, when I started going to the gym, I thought, why am I going to the gym? I don't wanna get big, I don't wanna get muscles, I don't, I don't even have time to go to the gym, but I'm going to the gym because all my friends, you know, it's like the next day when people say, what'd you do yesterday? I can say, oh, I went to the gym. So I go to the gym, I get a gym membership, and I go to the, get my gym membership, and I tell myself, Terrell, you are not gonna get swollen in this gym because your blazers won't fit. Um, <laughs> You're going to go to this gym just to stay healthy. So I tell the person who sells me my gym, gym membership, I really only need access to the treadmill because all I'm going to do is run. And I go to the gym, and I start running, and in walks a guy who looks like my twin. And by that, I mean he's just a black man. Um, and he comes in, and he walks in, and he walks over to the bench press. He sits down, and he starts getting prepared for his workout. And I'm running on the treadmill, but I'm watching him. And I watch him put weights on the bar, adjust the chair. And then interestingly enough, before he sits down, he gets over beside the machine and does this. One, 
two, and then he sits down, he starts lifting. And while running, I'm watching him lift, and I'm like, that looks so cool. <laughs> wow, he's like already sweating. I've been running for like 50 minutes, and I'm not sweating at all. Maybe I should lift weights. In fact, I think I'm going to leave here tonight. I'm going to go to Dick's Sporting Goods and get what I need in order to lift weights. Now, what do I need in order to lift weights? So I look at him. He has on shorts. He has on socks. He has on shoes. I have those things. Um, but he has on these um, wristbands. I don't know what that's about. And some gloves. So wristbands and gloves, that's great. I love, you know, accessories and all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to leave. I go to Dick's Sporting Goods. I tell the person at Dick's Sporting Goods, hey, look, I'm going to start lifting weights tomorrow. And they said, what for? I said, I have no idea. But, but listen, I need um, wristbands and I need gloves gloves and I need a headband and I get a whole, you know, and my shoes are red so everything matches head to toe so you can't judge, it's a safe space. Um, so I go back to the gym the very next night and I'm ready for my first ever um, weightlifting session. And how many of you in here, I ask students this all over the country, how many of you in here have ever felt like you had photographic memory? It actually is a skill. It's not like some secret power, although if you want it to be that, I, I like for it to be a secret power. It's this idea that we can actually remember, use our mind. Our mind gives us mental images. And if we train our mind, practice, as I said earlier, practice, recalling these images, we can recall very vivid images. I sort of practiced this in high school and in college. So when I close my eyes, I can remember the bar, how many weights he put on the bar. And so I said, oh, okay, got it, three and three. So I went and got three, <laughs> and I put them on the bar, and I adjusted the seat just like I saw, remember where he put his seat, and then before you know it, I sat down the, the um, seat, and I was about to start lifting weights, and I, oh my gosh, I forgot. So I hopped up, and I went, one, <laughs> two. I don't know why you do that, I thought this is what you're supposed to do, so then I sit back down in the chair, and I get ready to lift these weights. Um, now, here's what happened after that. So I'm here on the chair lifting weights. And it's really interesting because um, when I first got into the chair, I'm about to lift weights, it's really heavy. I mean, it's like very, very heavy. So I'm, I'm taking deep breaths and I'm pushing with my feet, trying to push and move the bar up some. And I did get it up. And the first thing I think we need to remind students of is that we are stronger than we will ever give ourselves credit for. I got it up one time, and it's up there. And on the way back down, I mean, it fell very, very quickly, but I mean, I had some level of control over it. And then I got ready to put it back up a second time, and I heard the door of the gym open, but I wasn't going to watch some in the middle of this very, very important life or death moment right here. So I'm lifting the bar and I'm trying my best. And I got like one side of it up almost. It felt like to me or either my arm ripped. I'm not sure. Um, but as I try to get the second one up, something happened. Have you ever had your arm just become like a noodle? It just does not want to be there anymore. So I get the bar up and then before you know it, I lose all feeling in my left arm. I, I, it's not there, it's like rubber. And out of nowhere, I can feel this bar is gonna come crashing across, it's gonna squash my throat. The headlines will read, Professor Killed in Jim. Um, <laughs> And so just as I just sort of gave it up and said, fine, I guess I'm about to die in the gym that night. And then nothing happened. So I thought I was in heaven. <laughs> because that's what they taught me growing up. There'd be no more pain and no more sorrow. So I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, I don't feel anything at all. And then when I open my eyes thinking I see my grandma again, I look up and there's the guy from the gym who I'd seen the night before who's caught the bar. And he's looking at me saying, what in the world are you doing? I said, what are you doing? I had that. He said, you did not have that. You were about to be. I said, well, I was trying to lift weights like I saw you lift the night before. By the way, he's a weight lifter. I am a professor. He said, first of all, what are you doing? You have unbalanced weights. And I said, what do you mean by unbalanced weights? He said, you have a 10 and a 20 and a five over here. You got a 50 and a four. I didn't know they, were, I didn't know they come in different sizes. <laughs> Why would you have weights in different sizes? That makes it complicated. I thought they were just different numbers, whatever. So I tell him, fine, balance them out. He said, secondly, um, why would you be ever lift by yourself? And I said, what am I supposed to do? He said, you're supposed to have a spotter. So he reset my weights balance them out, 
And then he said, now let's lift. I said, no, I can't lift. My arm is like noodle. I mean, it's not even there, right? So he, he grabs my arm, starts molesting it, feeling all over it, you know, whatever. <laughs> Before you know it, sure enough, I have feeling back in my arm. He says, is it okay? I'm like, yeah, what are you? Like, who are you? And he says, now we're going to lift. You wanted to lift, so we're going to lift a little. He said, but I'm going to spot you. And I said, what do you mean spot me? He said, I'm going to stand right over you like this with my arms cupped. I said, but you can't hold it because if you hold it, then I'm not lifting. He said, I'm not holding it. I'm just here. As long as you've got it, everything's fine. I'm here just saying, keep, what's your name, Terrell? Okay, keep going, Terrell. Don't stop to cheer you on. But the moment you start like you were before about to die, I've got it. I'm going to catch it and then pull it off of you. I'm sitting here making sure you, can, you don't take on too many weights or too much weights the whole time. Well, before you know it, I sat up and I was like, hold on a second. I started writing all these notes down because I think this idea of academic spotter has some currency. Who would be academic spotters for students? As long as they're doing well, your job is to stand there, be in their corner, tell them keep going, keep taking more credits, 15 to finish, um, eight semesters, you got it great, good, good, good. But the moment they take on too much, too much in the academic space, now they're leading a club or organization. Now they want to be a mentor at a local high school. Before you know it, they're piling on all of these opportunities and experiences. But someone who can be there and say, wait, 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 that's too much. Let me take some of this off for you. Let me give you some advice. So spotting them and helping them think about burdens, responsibilities, and the kind of commitments that they make. Because I think what we've learned is that students who take on way too many commitments there's a, the, the payoff, the compromise is in their academics. This whole notion of academic spotting has some potential. Think about it in terms of mentoring programs and those kinds of roles, academic advisors, peer mentors, and so forth. I'm going to pause for like a, quest, a question or two. Um, immediate questions that are on your mind. I keep hearing this thing. Hopefully you don't hear what I hear. Um, questions, thoughts on your mind from this morning or from this afternoon? My advisor, Don, always taught me. He has a counseling background. I don't. He said, you just have to wait. No one rushes to raise their hand for some reason. We have this thing called first follower effect. You ever heard about it? You can look at it on YouTube. First follower. Yes? So um, you talked about intrusive advising and at, uh, or intrusive mentoring. So at Kansas State, we have a black male initiative. Um, and we're in our first year. How, talk more about intrusive mentoring and how you go about doing that along with the spotting that you just talked about. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the, you know, I can talk about it, but it's putting it to practice. So tomorrow, Chi, my center, launches its first program ever. Um, it's called the Three E's of Success. It's a grant-funded 12-week um, intervention for men of color, and it is all around making sure that they increase their academic readiness, increase their job-seeking skills, and also increase their sense of self and belonging. Um, and part of this curriculum is this intrusive mentoring. It's like laying these ideas to practice. So for instance, um, how many of you in here um, you know, applied for the job that you currently hold? How many of you in here were interviewed for the job that you currently hold? Now, this one's going to be hard to ask, but just answer. It's a good safe space. How many of you in here know that everybody who applied for the job that you currently hold was not hired? Isn't that interesting? That is not true for most mentoring programs. Most mentoring programs ask, do you want to be a mentor? A person says yes. And we take the whole population of people who say yes. We don't do, I can't hire a single person to work in my center at the Center for Higher Education Enterprise without going through a background check. But you can be a mentor to a young person without a background check. You can be a mentor to a young person without even any evidence that you like young people. No application process usually whatsoever. And, it's, and if it is, it's usually just a will. Do you want to be one? Um, no evidence that you have ever impacted a young person or that young people like you. Um, they're inspired by you, that you know how to expose people. So I think all of that to me is the setup for a very effective, intrusive mentoring program. But then once you set the mentors, most people who sign up to be mentors don't know what they're supposed to do as a mentor. 
So we need more guidance about what mentors should do, list from which mentors can select certain activities. Um, ways in you know, I'm the benefit, I think one time me and my assistant tried to put together an account of how many mentoring programs I have participated in in my entire life. And I think just after getting too tired and quitting, we estimated that I've the, I'm the beneficiary of something like 39 different mentoring programs, formal mentoring programs. Now, if one mentoring program is supposed to be effective, what in the world could you expect of a person who's been through, I should be taller if, I'm, if I've been through 39 mentoring programs? 30, but most of those mentoring programs, I could tell you, were not worth the name that they carried. That's not to critique higher education sharply, that's just simply to say, some of them were like pairing me up with a person who I did not know, who took me to lunch, Usually, sometimes I had to still pay. Um, they talked to me for about an hour or two of my life that I'll never get back um, about when they led some organization or they did something, they marched on watch, a time when I wasn't even alive. Um, and then at the end of it, they usually close with, you know, now I talk this whole period, so next time we'll hear about you. Well, I'm smart enough not to ever go back. That's not intrusive. Intrusive um, should be the opposite. It should have the, the, the protege, the learner at the center. That the first meeting should always be about them, not us. Intrusive. Um, that it should, because what the mentor needs from the protege is information about where they're headed. What is it that they want out of life? How ready are they to make those kinds of decisions? So that the a uh, mentor can start to assess, like, what role can I play? Okay, so for a person who knows nothing about where they're headed, then there's a, a, a very critical role, exposure to all sorts of um, opportunities and experiences. A person is pretty clear on where they want to go, then the role is pretty defined. They're, the mentor's job is to start providing the protege with experiences that would land them to the destination they have for themselves or to expose them to other alternative pathways as well. Um, intrusive mentoring, that's what that looks like to me. Um, I think for African-American men, by the way, Don Creamer is not black. People always say to me, like, I think that's so great because we need more black men in higher education like your doctoral advisor, and he's very white. Um, and he's also very 80 years old. Um, he's from Texas. And if you look at us, like, I'm this, and he looks like Hulk Hogan, the old version. <laughs> and, but we are perfect for one another because, now, I do think... We need more black male mentors and Native American mentors in higher education. We need more LGBTQ mentors in higher education. But mentoring is not that kind of matching. You know, the person who uh, may be a good match for a student is not necessarily the person who matches them in terms of their gender, race, age. I've had lots of mentors in my life uh, across different um, races and ethnicities and genders. I think we have to think about a cabinet of mentors for students ultimately. But right now, in the sense of an intrusive, it's one who, to be intrusive, the student has to trust the person. So I think you have to start to assess, like, what level of trust can the person build? And by the way, one way to build trust, we already know, if you've ever worked in residence life or student affairs, you already know all the secrets to this. One way to build trust is through vulnerability. So the mentor has to be willing to share with the protege their own success stories, their own failures, the, own, the things that they've overcome. And by being vulnerable, it opens up a space for the protege to do the same, but also to ultimately trust the mentor. Does that help? Yes. Yeah. Um, remember, Chee's website, chee.osu.edu. Um, shown on the screen are those, those technologies. And also, if you have not already, please uh, go to the Android Google Play Store or to the um, iPhone App Store. Um, Mac App Store to download our mobile app. It's also a good way to keep up with resources, but more importantly, even after today, to keep in touch with the kind of resources that I provided. And then I know some people already said that they've downloaded the higher ed libs, so you can feel free to get it from there. It's been my great pleasure. Hopefully this is helpful and you got something else from this. I'm available by email or on social media. Thank you.